person or whatever it might be. Um, from anybody that I know that's investigated, for the most part, Ian, it seems to be like what you got. They hear footsteps in the hallway upstairs. Yeah. Sounds like mm-hmm. a boot or, a, you know, like a somebody walking. It's not right. soft. It's quite, you can hear it on the floor. Um, doors rattling, you know, locks turning, those kinds of things. Um, that makes sense to me, especially if the original innkeeper is still in the inn. <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, Good if that person yep. Yep. yeah, is, you know, walking down the hall and going room to room checking on, you know, just on guests or just whatever they would have done day to day in there. But it's an interesting spot for sure. And and for me now, I have a better appreciation of it because I did the research and I found out the real story. And mm-hmm. I think that it makes the site that much more interesting and and while you know the Swayze murder did not take place in there it certainly got transplanted to there from those owners that took it over so it's you know it it has definitely got its own history now uh, in terms of of its many you know many varied tales and and it makes it that much more interesting um is there is there any other places that you found that you were investigating there ian like did you actually get in other sites or is it more just um the typical ghost stories of the of the town um well i as i mentioned um when i was on a couple weeks ago about fort george um Mm -hmm. we've gotten some evps from the little girl sarah ann Right, at yes, the fort, yeah. who was the daughter of an officer stationed there. Mm-hmm. Um, and families often stayed with the with the officers on at the location, so that's they not did, unheard yeah. of. Yeah. yeah, yeah, officers brought their yeah. families. And Fort George is an interesting spot because it has such a vast, again, another pretty intense history that so many people don't see beyond the fort. You know, you go in as a tourist and right. you see this fort and you kind of walk in. I mean, it's not a huge fort. It's a good size, but in compared to places like Fort Henry or Lunenburg or, you know, like Louis, Louisburg, all of those, it's pretty small. Um, fort Erie, it's, it's probably twice the size of yeah. Fort Erie. Fort Erie is incredibly small, but at the same time, it's pretty active. I've, I've picked up on quite a lot of things in Fort George, just uh, being there working the site in my archaeology days, um, actually being there for other events, going through the fort, uh, doing investigations, things like that. Um, it, it's pretty active. I don't find that there's anything at Fort George that's particularly malicious or scary. But I've never come across anything that no. way. No, no, me neither. And no. although, but it's, it's yeah. active enough. It's like if you go very active. Now, yeah. Yeah. You will that, get that reminds me of a uh, Frankie's diner in, in Messina. It's just very active. Um, and yeah. it, if you go there, we're pretty much guaranteed to get, um, some kind of activity, which is really interesting. And, uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's not malicious by any stretch of the imagination. No. Now, you know, I want to ask you, have you heard the story about Town Hall with the chandelier? No. No. No? Okay. I'm going to tell you this Detail. story. It's a story, but it's also from an investigation. And I'm not the first person that this has happened to. And we went there. Now, I have to sort of plot it out now because the old Town Hall, it's a very typical structure of an old Town Hall. It's essentially made, it's a block Town Hall. It's I want to say it's three floors in total. There is an actual basement in there. Now, the basement today is the, um, it's kind of like a tourist place. You can go in and get brochures and and all of that kind of stuff, right? Um, The second floor at the front is, uh, you don't really get to go in there, but it's, it's, the town has taken it over essentially, right? But it's no longer a town hall. There are some offices in there, but the Shaw Theater has a theater yeah. at the back where the jail used to be. So the jail was oh, on so the back the old, end now. Um, this is the old courthouse you're talking about. Yeah, the old courthouse, town hall, right? Yeah. So yeah, okay. because it was both, right? It was the courthouse and it was town hall and it was the jail. So it's essentially the jail was at the back. The court was in kind of the middle there was a uh, office town offices at the front mm-hmm. i believe there was probably one town office at the time uh but so it's it's kind of a combined building but now the theater has the back half of the building 
and the rest of it. So in the main part of the building, and, and if you've ever gone up the front stairs and you can look through the windows there, you can see there's a large sort of open area office whatever you want to call it now. I think it was just the foyer originally when you walked into the old place. But there's big chandeliers that hang from the ceiling in there. And so they've been rewired at this point, <laughs> excuse me, to electricity, of course. Originally, they would have been gas lit or candle lit at one point probably as well. But um, we were in there doing, we were doing an investigation and this is going back, oh my gosh, I don't even know how long now, 15 years ago, maybe something like that. Um, I was doing an investigation in there and it was really very quiet. I didn't get a lot of feel in the front of the building, but it was a hot summer evening and it was very still and it was late August, I think, at the time. So it was quite humid. It was pretty warm. There was no AC on in the building. And we got to go in. It was about 10 o'clock at night. It was just after the theater let out at the back half. They they were finished. Um, We got to go into the front half. We didn't get to spend a lot of time there. But we went into the front. We were maybe an hour, hour and a half. And at that time, we didn't really have any fancy equipment, right? It was uh, (laughs) was just... You know, kind of go in, get a feel. I went in, you know, we walked, we sort of stayed in this one sort of front area. We moved around. Um, A couple of people had some very early, um, what we call K2s now, but like a very early version of that, going around with that. And at one point, we all sort of stopped because we could hear this creaking sound. And it was like, literally sort of if you had a swing, like a chain, you know, that creaking, like that... eh! And we couldn't figure out where it was coming from until another person that was with us says, oh, my God, look. And we all turn and look, and this big chandelier is swinging on the ceiling. There was no breeze. There was no wind. It was swinging. How creepy is that? It was moving enough that it was noticeable. So we're not talking pendulum Oh, my goodness. Waking back and forth. But it was moving. The other one on the other side of the room did not move at all. You don't. Right. So then many years right. later, fast forward, we're now doing tours in town. Um, this was maybe five years ago. And we used to meet mm-hmm. our our um, tour goers in front of, of this building. And so we we have another tour one night. And uh, that was our we were doing our Pirates of the Great Lake history tour. And so we were meeting up out front and this person who was on our tour happened to tell me they used to work in the building and they were telling me the exact same story about the swinging chandelier. Mm -hmm. And I, and, and not, they weren't there when we were there. This just happened to them when they worked in the building more than once. And she said she never wanted to be in there at night. Um, It, (laughs) <laughs> she is like, as, you know, she wanted to be out of the building. Now, I never felt anything creepy or, you know, scary, but right. the fact that this chandelier moves and and she had the same experience and apparently other people have had the same experience in that building. Um, I think it's one of those buildings where we probably would never get in to investigate again. They're pretty, they're pretty, you know pretty sticklers in in Niagara on the Lake and things like that. No, they don't like you, you know, doing that. Even though it's a big part of what the town is today, they're they're still very, you know, they're still very sort of against that whole image of being labeled as a ghost town, uh, literally. (laughs) But, yeah, uh, yeah, interesting. And, um, Ian, did you, do you know the Mason story for the town? Um. I, the Mason Building. I've heard it before. Yeah, I've heard it before, but I really don't remember what it was that I'd heard. Okay, so I think it just in terms of you know when we were doing the tours, the haunted tours, we were given information about the Mason's Building. So the Mason Building in town, Rachel, it's pretty yeah, underwhelming. Okay. It's just a right. essentially a block building that was constructed out of leftover rubble after the War of 1812. So it's kind of a flat front Georgian building. There's nothing particularly fancy about it. It's a gray block building. um, And it has two floors in it. And on one side 
of the building is a art gallery now. And on the other side, the Mason's Lodge. And I'm not even sure if it's still a Mason's Lodge to this day. I haven't really been there in a long time, but <laughs> it was a Mason's Lodge. So at one point, the whole thing was the Mason's Lodge, but today it's kind of split into two pieces. And the story goes that it's haunted. Well, I will say okay. yes, it is haunted. Um, interestingly enough, my mm -hmm. middle son, we were there. They came on a tour, my youngest and my middle son. They used to often come with uh, Ed and I when we were doing the tours. And my middle son, one day, yeah. he, we were there and we were doing the tour. And he pulled me aside and he goes, Mom, he goes, there's a girl in there. And I'm like, oh, where, right? And he goes, yeah, yeah, it's a black a black girl. I see a black girl, and she's going up the stairs, and she's dressed in a maid's outfit. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I'm looking, and I'm like, I don't see anything, honey. And he's like, no, no, it's she's she's not here. It's she's a ghost, right? And I'm like, oh, okay. And now he gave me her name, and honestly, right now I can't remember it off the top of my head. But we wrote it down. Yeah. Um, I went home. I I looked it up. And the funny thing was, is there was a girl in there and she was what we would really? call, well, at the time they had her listed as mulatto, which means that she, okay. you know, obviously had a white parent right. and a black parent. Right. So, but mm -hmm. she was a maid in the Masons building and she was 17 okay. at the time. So interesting that he happened to see her walking up the staircase That's through the window. He just looked in and, you know, this was an yeah. evening tour. There was nobody there. He saw her. I was able to find her. I have to go into my notes and look back at what her name was. I believe it was Anne, but I have to go back and double check that. But so there's this story. So that Mason's building also has another fancy story attached to it where there was a Mason from upstate New York who wrote a tell-all on the Masons. Oh, and I've heard this one before. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you know this story, yeah. right? So so apparently what happens is he writes this tell-all on the Masons because he's mad at them because they didn't want to publish his, you know, they, they were trying to stop him from publishing his book. And so oh. anyways, what happens is the story goes that the Masons caught up with him and they killed him and they threw his body in the Niagara River and he went Stop. missing. And so oh, oh. then... Then they dragged the river and they found a body. And the body they found, they brought back to the morgue when they wanted his wife to come and ID the body. But the funny thing about the story, and we'll just kind of, you know, cut to the chase here, is it wasn't him. They had actually doctored the body to try to make it look like him. But his wife oh. was like, no, this is not him. And so the history, <laughs> So the story goes that... He, they murdered him. They took his only copy manuscript of the book. They put it in a box oh. and they buried it somewhere. Well, oh, it, makes for, it makes for a good story. And part of the story is very true. He did release and write a tell-all book on the Masons. But they didn't kill him. What they did, and again, there's, oh. written, there's written historical evidence of this, which I love, they gave him $300 and they sent him to Hamilton, Ontario. And they said, go away, take your book, leave, go to the United so States, funny. go anywhere, just not just here. Just don't be here. Just yes. don't be here. So they gave him That's money. He, he, he took the money and there's actual proof of him taking a horse and riding it to Hamilton. When he got to Hamilton, yeah. he got some transportation that took him. He got on a boat. Okay, so he went up the St. Lawrence wow. River. He got on a boat. He ended up down in Honduras. No. So he, oh, wow. he was, it, well, this is, and this is where it gets really crazy. So he's in okay. Honduras. He hooks up with pirates. I kid you not. He takes up with pirates. Is in pirates? Honduras. That's awesome. Yep, pirates. Ends up in Honduras, is living in Honduras, has a new wife, likely a, a local, you know, uh, indigenous woman that he's, he's hooked up with in Honduras. And he's wow. writing letters to his lodge brother in Pennsylvania. Now, one of his lodge brothers in Pennsylvania took his daughter in and he looked after her. 